star in his own lifetime, his own lunchtime, who's going to tell you what happens next. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Paul. Tim, Tim Wonder, who is, uh, very kindly uh, offered to host us here. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, and uh, just to echo Tim's uh, thoughts there, of course, our wishes are with the Raw family on this occasion. We uh, had the dilemma, do we go ahead? And we presumed that you would wish that we would. And if you decided we, you wouldn't, then presumably you wouldn't be here in the first place. So the show will go on uh, in that uh, honour, respectfully speaking. Um, thank you, Tim, for setting the scene. Delight to be here as well, as Tim says, where it began really, on the, on the Isle of Wight. Um, this is the 100th birthday of British broadcasting, and hopefully in the course of this show we'll see the, uh, the journey a little from radio as that one-to-one uh, -one communication essentially into something more that we would recognise as broadcasting today. So I wanted to um, uh, present this a show, talk, event, um, via two characters, two genuine real-life radio pioneers. Um, did I, if, if I were to have a budget, I would have hired another actor, but I do not, as you can tell by the quality of your programmes. Um, so instead, I will be portraying uh, both of these real-life characters uh, this evening, and there will be a very cunning uh, way of discovering who it is I'm playing at any one time. Uh, sometimes I'll be playing... Arthur Burroughs, other times Peter Eckersley. Arthur Burroughs, Peter Eckersley. Have you cracked the code yet? <laughs> Excellent work, well done. Very good, you've made it. Uh, any questions, see me after. In fact, genuinely, if there are any questions, do save them up and ask afterwards. Sometimes at these shows, um, we, uh, I sort of throw the floor open to, to a Q&A for any uh, uh, questions left. Um, and, uh, but I've never done it before with, with Tim here. Uh, so the Q&A could last some time uh, this evening, uh, so at which point it may be one of those shows that you just file out one by one slowly until it's just me and Tim left having a... Out by midnight, there we go. Uh, does anyone need to get a ferry? No, good news, there you go, we're fine. Fair enough. Um, and, uh, and indeed we are also here um, uh, tomorrow doing a show which is sold out? Sold out? A few tickets left. Excellent, very good of you. So tomorrow is stand-up comedy, tonight is stand-up history. Um, but if you have come here for... Has anyone come here for comedy? Oh, yeah. Two of you, great. Okay, well, I'm sorry. Uh, you can stay on the floor till tomorrow night. I know there are at least two jokes in the show, so uh, all that to look forward to. Um, but let's journey back then uh, to the Great War to begin with. Um, and... Arthur Burroughs uh, for the first broadcast. Uh, this is London calling, this is London calling, this is London calling. Well, that is to come because this is wireless, or as our American cousins would have it. This is radio. Yes, a tad common, do you not think? Of course, here uh, in the United Kingdom, we call it wireless because, after all, wireless is indeed a great British invention, if you count Marconi as British. And why wouldn't you, of course? Granted, he is Italian by birth, but did the Italian government have any interest in his creation of development of wireless technology? No, they did not. The young Marconi attempted to sell his idea to the Italian Navy, but they had none of it. As a teenager, Marconi was the first ever teenager to have radio in his bedroom uh, when he effectively rang a bell across the room. But it was when he came to London to seek his fortune that really Marconi the man was born. The scene is Toynbee Hall in East London when he walks in to the great and the good of the engineering world with two boxes not dissimilar to this and he places one box on the table and the other box across the room and he pushes a button in one box and wirelessly across the room in the other box the bell rings and Marconi 
The 21-year-old says quite simply, my name is Guglielmo Marconi and I have just invented wireless. It's a drops mic moment if he'd invented a microphone to drop at that early stage. But that would come. For now, we are talking about wireless telegraphy, that is dots and dashes, wireless telephony, the human voice. Well, that would follow. I should introduce myself. My name is Arthur Burrows, Director of Publicity for the Marconi Company. Although during this great war that we find ourselves in, my job is mostly to intercept German radio propaganda. And in the early years of the war, that is largely wireless telegraphy. It's the dots and the dashes in the ether that we can detect. There are occasional flashes, though. There are rumours that the human voice is being transmitted more frequently. There is a couple in Worcester, uh, the Donisthorpes, a charming couple, Captain Horace Donisthorpe and his wife Gertrude. Now, by day, Captain Horace trains up uh, army recruits into the ways of the wireless so that they can communicate in the trenches. By evening, Captain Horace and Gertrude Donisthorpe do what young couples do, not that, they would cycle to a field on the outskirts of Worcester and Captain Horace would, would set up a wireless receiving set on one side of the field and his wife Gertrude would cycle to the other side of the field and she would uh, communicate wirelessly uh, with a small gramophone player. Um, she would introduce the, the song that would be about to be played and then she would play the song on the gramophone player for her audience of one, her husband, across the field. An audience of one, but still technically Britain's first disc jockey. Uh, granted, quite often she would cycle across the field to check if her husband had heard her. Unfortunately, she'd miss him because he'd cycled the other way around the field to see if his wife had sent the message yet. And often they just cycled around and around the field for much of the evening. But for now, wireless is mostly dots and dashes with occasional other moments. Well, yes, indeed. Down at Brooklyn's aerodrome, uh, my team and I, we have a, a different route plan. We're looking at how to communicate wirelessly with aviation. And I was there, Captain Peter Pendleton Eckersley, for the very moment, for the first time, the human voice was transmitted to a plane in flight, which is better than a plane in the air that's still, because that falls rather quickly, but I was there for that magical moment when my, my boss, Major Prince, said, uh, Captain Furnival, F Fernie, if, if you are hearing this, it is the first time the human voice has been communicated to a, an aeroplane in flight. Dip if you are hearing me. And the plane bowed to Marconi's greatness. An incredible moment. From then on, we knew that we could communicate in flight between the plane and the ground, and ultimately, potentially, between a plane and, and a, another, another aeroplane. Um, we then have the rather difficult task of training uh, aviators to not only fly a plane and operate the munitions, the artillery, but also to use one of these as they go to send messages, Morse code, potentially. Uh, it is difficult, but one in ten of the pilots don't make it home, but nine out of ten do. So that's, that's not bad, unless, of course, they do ten flights, in which case that's not particularly good odds. But you understand the point. In war, these things happen, and technology moves on. Well, we move on indeed, and towards the end of the war, I am starting to pick up, as I'm intercepting that German wireless propaganda, I'm starting to hear more of the human voice. Just a few more words are coming through amid the dods and the dashes. Not many words, just a few, but they are German words, so they're a lot longer. Uh, or oh, my name's not Johann Gamble Putty Devon Ausfen Splendon Schlitter Kraskin Bon Freidiger Dingle Dangle Dongle Dungle Burstein von Nacker Thrasher Applebanger Horowitz Grand Nice Teich Slentic Grand Notti Speltiger Grand Grummelmeyer Speltervasser Kirsten Kimberleisen Bahnwerke Guten Abend Schönenberg Burger Nerden Schönendanke Kalfleisch Mittelrauke von Hauptkopf of Ulm. And his wife, Catherine Gamble Putty, to what else? When you spend the Christmas, but let's not go there entirely, as Monty Python's Flying Circus will write some 50 years hence from now. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, shall we? No, as the war concludes, the human voice is coming through the ether a little more. And those who are left, those who, who mourn, they come back and they have kept their, their wireless sets from the war. And they wonder what to do with them. And I had 
an idea. It's 1919 when I, I write my idea down for my employer, Mr Marconi, and I suggest to him in a memo, uh, there appears to be no serious reason why before we are many years older, politicians speaking, say, in Parliament, should not be heard simultaneously by wireless in the reporting room of every newspaper office in the United Kingdom. Just imagine wireless and government sure to be the best of friends for all time, I am certain. The field of wireless telephone is by no means restricted, of course, to newspaper work. Uh, the same idea may be extended to make possible the correct reproduction uh, in all private residences of Albert Hall and Queen's Hall concerts. You know, music in the domestic home. Uh, there would be no technical difficulty in the way of an enterprising advertisement agency arranging for the interval of the concert to be filled with audible advertisements, and this will help pay for it, you see. Uh, pathetic or forcible appeals on behalf of somebody's soap or tomato ketchup. So, so Mr Marconi, what do you think to this? And he essentially sits there in a chair with money either side and says, I'm out. But it was a nice idea while it lasted, using wireless radio to communicate not just one to one, but one to many, because what Marconi sees as a problem is the flaw of wireless, that it can be overheard. There's no such thing as a private wireless communication. You send your message and anyone on the right frequency can hear it. But I see this not as a flaw, but as an opportunity to send messages out there wider. Sure, surely in the Titanic, that's one of the earliest examples of essentially broadcast, sending one message to many, knowing that the right person has to, to pick it up. It's like the parable of the sower in the Bible. We scatter the seed, it's cast broadly, it's broadly cast, there may be a word in there that we can create somehow, not knowing which of the seed will be picked up and which will be ignored. There's a hope in there, I'm sure, one day. But for now, Mr Marconi says no, and so it goes back to uh, the Marconi company returns to doing what it does best, which is making money, essentially, hoping that we will send Marconi grounds across the world, person to person, one to one, and we will pay money to do it, of course. And so to do this, we need uh, experimentation. There's a man called Captain Round. Now, he's been sending uh, wireless messages off the coast of Ireland to America the first time the human voice has been sent across the Atlantic with his assistant, Mr Ditcham. And Round and Ditcham then return to, uh, to Chelmsford uh, via Marconi House in London, where Captain Round has a workshop. And someone else is also after that workshop once they've now finished down at Brooklyn's aerodrome. Yes, you see, we've finished our work at Brooklyn's. The war has ended and we are no longer looking at communicating with planes in flight to go to war. But it turns out now that we're in a time of peace, we've been to Germany back and forth so many times, we'd all like to go on a holiday there now. Um, and so civil aviation is born. And we move from Brooklands to Croydon Aerodrome. It's to become really one of the world's first uh, airports. And we will use this means of communicating to planes in flight. And therefore we can, we can control in some way the traffic that's in the air. And we can call that thing control of traffic in the air. Or something. We'll fix it later on, I'm sure. And so uh, we designed this thing in Croydon, but there's no space for us there. So I go to Marconi House in London uh, to inquire for some space. I'm aware there's a room there, Captain Round's workshop. And I go to Marconi House in 1919, uh, and I am to meet there a man called... Arthur Burroughs. This may get awkward. Ah, Mr Eckersley, come in. You don't mind if I don't take my hat off to you. I normally would, but it could get difficult. No, I quite understand. I left my hat at home, which is quite convenient. Isn't it just? Oh, absolutely. I hear you have some space for us. Captain Round's workshop in the basement. Oh, we do. Would you like to sit? I tell you what, why don't I do all the talking for a minute? Good idea. So, in the basement, Captain Round's workshop exists, but he's been there in Ireland sending these messages off of the coast. But uh, he's going to come back. He needs his workshop, surely. Not only that, the workshop we have here is to design this thing we're now going to call air traffic control. It's got a better ring to it, we decided. I have one question, though, Mr Burroughs. Yes, Mr Eckersley. How is it that here off the River Thames, here in the Strand, in Marconi House, where are we going to park the plane? 
Yes, indeed. You're right to stare. Um, I don't think it's been fully thought through. So actually, Marconi House and the Strand in London will not do for us. But we hear there is the Chelmsford Works over in Essex. Oh, well, there is, Mr. Eckes. I don't know that there's much room for you there, though. Captain Round will need it. But there is a small village two miles from Chelmsford called Rittle. There is a beautiful village green. There is a duck pond. There is a pub. We'll take it. Um, we can't wait to go there. So my team, of uh, half a dozen or so, we go to Rittle in Essex, a small, sleepy, village green type place near Chelmsford and located right by the pub. But crucially, it's dozens of miles away from the interfering uh, people and busybodies of Marconi House HQ in London. So my team can get on with what we need to do, creating air traffic control. You with me so far? It gets better, by the way, don't worry. This is all just setting the scene for the first 20 minutes. Right? Ah, yes, well, of course, to uh, there's the Marconi company returns, and my job returns to being the publicity director, to spreading word of how we are spreading word. And the tests continue. Captain Round and Mr Ditcham, now their job in Chelmsford, is to test how far and of what quality we can send the human voice so that these Marconi grams can be sold to members of the public. And to do this, of course, they need to send messages. And in doing these messages, as Mr Marconi himself has noted, it's a rather leaky medium, and therefore people hear those messages. And the sort of messages they would hear would be Mr Ditcham reading things out, just rather perfunctorily, rather boringly, numbers, days of the week, months of the year, and particularly this. Railway timetables. That's what he's reading out day in, day out. Mr. Ditcham reading railway timetables. But it turns out that people who've kept their wireless set since the war, well, they've heard this. And the ships at sea, they're hearing this as well. In fact, my job as publicity director, it's done for me because it's made the papers, not the front page, granted. It's the letters to the editor. But here we go. Uh, one reader, uh, one radio ham, has written to the newspaper saying, it has been interesting to hear the test transmissions from MZX in Chelmsford, the, the station there. Um, ah, but couldn't they find something more interesting than transmitting a lot of boring railway stations? Mr Ditcham, dull as ditch water. Everyone's a critic, aren't they? And so I make a telephone call to Chelmsford, from Marconi House. <clears throat> uh, hello, ah, oh, Mr. Ditcham. Yes, it's Arthur Burroughs here from Marconi. Yes, the man with the hat. Yes, how are you? Marvellous. Yeah, no, we're loving, loving the railway timetables. Well, I know we can't help but hear them, you see. It's on all the, yeah, we just hear it on our radio sets. And, oh, you've seen the newspaper as well. He's seen the newspaper as well. Yes, I know it's, it's rather a, a tough review. You weren't expecting it, were you? No. Well, could you read, read something else maybe? Well, actually, yes, the newspaper. It's a good idea. Oh, you were thinking the back pages. I was thinking the front pages. Well, why don't you read the front pages first and then the back pages? Yes, news followed by sport. It may catch on. You never know. <laughs> you could throw in the weather. By all means, feel free. But the new yes, well, just pick up a newspaper and give it a read, would you? And he does. As 1920 begins, so does Britain's first programme title, Ditcham's New Service. <laughs> And more people listen. I think it's a hit. It, we have even hundreds of people, hundreds, can you imagine such a thing, listening in on their devices. It's going so well, I think we can develop it a little further. And so I make another phone call to Chelmsford. Mr Ditcham, it's Arthur Burroughs here again. Hello, man with a hat. Yes, indeed. Loving, loving the newspapers. Yes. Uh, ah, oh, oh, right. He's... They've had, a, they've had a message sent from the newspaper, from the Daily, the Daily Mail. Oh, the Daily Mail have been in touch. I'm sure they'll be best of friends with wireless, absolutely, yes. And, oh, they're not too happy 
because he's reading the news from the day's newspaper. They're worried he's giving away the news for free. They've asked if he'll sit on the newspaper for a day and then read the news the next day, so he's always reading yesterday's news. Because the ship's at sea, to be fair, they haven't heard the news for weeks. They won't really mind whether what, what, what's going on. So what do you think, Mr Ditchum? Anything else beyond the... Music! Yeah, I was thinking some music would be nice. What, some gramophone records or, or some, some live music? Oh, wonderful. It turns out that some of the employees there, the Chelmsford workstation, are actually quite musical on a weekend. You know, they play in a band, that sort of thing. So what have you got? You've got an, an oboist and, and a woodwindist, which is like an oboist, but a bit more general, and uh, a pianist. And can they bring all the instruments to the, uh, the works? Well, the pit, you can wheel a piano in, can't you? It's only up a few stairs, it'll be fine. And, um, and a singer. Ah, oh, they have a marvellous singer, Edward Cooper. But it turns out that he sings in a band with, with a woman, uh, Winifred Sayer. Now, unfortunately, she... Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll tell them. Don't worry. It do doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter. It's Arla White. Don't worry about it. Um, so uh, it turns out that Winifred Sayer, she, she sings with the band as well. They'll have to maybe work on fine-tuning the microphone to see if it can pick up a woman's voice. But I'm sure that's doable in time. And... Unfortunately, she works for the factory next door, Hoffman's Ball Bearings, which I guess means that she won't do it for free, will she? No, we'll have to pay her. Well, I suppose, yes, technically it would make Wireless's first professional broadcast artiste. It's rather a nice thing for her. Five shillings a go? Perfect. So there you go. Five shillings a go, Winifred Sayer is going to sing for us from Chelmsford to anyone who will listen. And the first song she sings, ironically entitled... Absent. And messages come in. We have telegrams from ships at sea, from Norway, from the Atlantic. People are listening in to Winifred Sayer. It's a hit. Who amongst us could possibly find problem with this? This is all very well, but we've got air traffic to control up there, or to design at least, and we'll ultimately control it once we've designed it, but we can't even design it because the one plane that we've got parked on the green, we can't communicate with because all we can hear is blimmin' warbling. Two miles away it might be, but it might as well be in the next room as far as we're concerned. This wonderful Winifred Sayer is all very well and marvellous, but no, we are not particular fans here in Riddle, but, but fair play, for now, she may continue. Phone's ringing. So I put my hat on so you could tell who's speaking. It's Arthur Burroughs speaking. Hello. Oh, it's the Daily Mail. It's the Daily Mail. Hello, yes. They couldn't possibly have a problem either, could they? It's... Also, I know the editor, Tom Clark. We were war buddies. He was helping me in intercept that German wireless propaganda with, um, you know, Johann Gamble Putter. We won't go there again. Hello, Tom. How are you? Tom, nice to speak to you. Yes, have you heard our messages? You've heard our little broadcast. Very nice. Oh, you'd like... To... You'd like to sponsor... A radio broadcast, the Daily Mail, would like to help fund this. It's a marvellous thing. Very good, OK, well, um, Winifred said she does cost five shillings a go. Oh, no, you want to go... Oh, do they want somebody else? Dame Nellie, Mel Dame Nellie Melba? You know, of Peach Melba, Melba Toast fame. I mean, how many people do you know have named a pudding? Come on, you know. So, Dame Nellie... She's the world's premier opera singer, of course. She won't be five shillings... A thousand pounds. A thousand pounds. That was enough to buy a house. That's a, that is, that's not was, that is, and at present tense, it is enough to buy a house in 1920, or a tank of petrol in 2022. <laughs> so, um, yes, very good. So, Mel, Mel, well, the trouble is, we can't go and visit her at the Albert Hall, where she's doing a run of concerts. You see the, um, well, no, they the, the, see the transmitter's too big, it won't leave the factory. Well, how big? Well, I don't know if you know, um, do you know the ballroom at Northwood House in the Isle of Wight? <laughs> yeah, it's about the size of the end wall. Yeah, so if you can imagine, we can't, we can't ship that to the Albert Hall. So Melba will have to come to Chelmsford. And she does. Yes, that's how dramatic it is. And she comes, how long is this cable? There it is. Um, she, the plans are made for June the 15th, 1920. The Daily Mail will publicise this all week long. This is no longer a test of quality and of range. It's a test of audience to see if this is publicised. Will people listen in? Will they find their radio sets? Will they make them? Will they buy them, potentially, from the Marconi Company? Of course. Uh, Melba is 
Eventually convinced, she begins off thinking that her voice is not to be toyed with, but ultimately the thousand pounds does tempt her, plus her rider of a barely cooked chicken and a warm glass of champagne. It's like she's been to a thousand weddings and that's what she thinks you have. But anyway, the date is set and it's all planned for. There are hiccups. The day before the event, um, it's decided that we uh, need to have the executive dining suite. It's the only place befitting a star of Melba's quality. Um, mahogany sides, it's beautiful. Uh, to do this, we have to snake a cable all the way through the Chelmsford workstation. And in doing this, it's a little overloaded. And so a small fire snakes through this cable and burns down the executive dining suite. <laughs> Luckily, Melba wasn't there at the time. Otherwise, it would be Melba toast. Well done, everybody. Very good. That was... That was one of the two jokes, so just um, <laughs> one more to go then. Okay, so all is fine. It does mean we have to relocate. So I, and I, by the way, of course, I, I'm in London throughout this. Um, I come along and I realise that, that Melba essentially needs someone uh, to accompany her, to escort her. So on the train, I should be her official escort, director of publicity for the Marconi company. Secretly, all along, I've been dying to get along to Chelmsford. In fact, on one occasion, for one of the broadcasts, you could hear the woodwindist, the oboist, the pianist, the singer, and in the background, <laughs> yes, Arthur Burroughs on recorder, because I just couldn't wait to be there. I had to be part of this. Mr. Ditchum, though, he has always been the announcer, and so I will be the escort for, or the escort, depending on how you like to pronounce things, for Dame Nellie Melba on the train. And we finally arrive at Chelmsford Station. The Rolls-Royce is waiting for her. Word reaches me that the new room that they found, the packing shed, is not ready yet. For a star of Melba's quality, uh, the executive dining suite, no longer available, bit burned. Um, the packing shed needs a few rugs and curtains to make it look, look nice, like the Albert Hall. And so someone has gone down to make this all nice and move all the kit. So we need to buy ourselves a little bit of time. So I give Melba a tour of the Chelmsford works. I point out the two 450 foot masts that tower over Chelmsford. And I say, Dame Nelly Melba, very shortly your voice will be sent from the top of those masts all across Europe. And she says, young man, if you think I'm gonna climb all the way up there. <laughs> I still don't quite know if she was joking. So I bring her down and I walk her to the packing shed, which is now ready. Everyone is incredibly nervous. We can have no more fires. In fact, a photographer from the press fires a little flash bulb off and one of the technicians thinks it's another fire, shuts everything down again. It's another five minutes before it starts up. And so a little late after all, we finally begin the broadcast. Now, to make sure that there are no further problems and fires, um, Mr. Ditcham, who was to announce it's decided he needs to be actually there with the transmitters in the hut next door to the packing shed. And, and therefore he's unable to announce. And so it must fall to somebody else to do the announcement for the world's first proper broadcast, I like to think. And finally, my moment has come. Oh, yes. <clears throat> hello, hello. This is Arthur Burroughs, the director of programmes of the Marconi Company, uh, publicity director. We have very few programmes at this stage. Dame Nelly Melba will sing for you now. She takes one look at this packing shed, kicks away the rugs, tears down the curtain, saying, I can't possibly sing on that. Now it looks like a packing shed once again. There is an audience of half a dozen. It's Melba's smallest audience she's ever played to. So it looks, but actually it's the largest audience she's ever played to due to the thousands of people who are listening in at home and at sea. Uh, Dame Nelly Melba, the prima donna will sing for you now in English and then Italian and then in French. Dame Nelly Melba, will you sing? And Dame Nelly Melba takes the microphone, which looks not dissimilar to this, but with a, uh, a sort of a hat box attached to the front, which looks almost exactly like a microphone that you may have seen on the way in, for example. And she approaches it and she gives a long trill, her hello to the world. And then she commences her first song. Home, sweet home. And I'm aghast 
It's incredible. I'm sitting there with the world's premier singer in front of me, being broadcast to who knows how many people. Unbeknownst to me at the time, her assistant, who's listening in, in Blackfriars in London, next to Tom Clark, the Daily Mail editor, is disbelieving of all this until she hears her employer's voice. And unmistakably, this magic has occurred. It's Melba. And her assistant falls off the chair, nearly faints with surprise and alarm at hearing this unmistakable sound. Others are hearing it hundreds of miles away, across the sea, even to the Middle East. It will take weeks for us to receive the telegrams of appreciation, but they will come. And Melba then sings in Italian and in French, and she's just on her last song when... <laughs> Radio silence. It cuts out completely. There in the packing shed room, we have no idea. She carries on singing. We sit there enjoying it. But pacing around outside in the courtyard, Captain Round, with his headphones clasped to his ears, he knows what's going on. And if he needs any proof what's going on, straight away, Mr. Ditcham emerges from the transmitter hut, covered in black soot and has no eyebrows now, saying, a valve has blown, as if Captain Round needed telling that. All he says is simply, how long do you need to fix it? Ditcham says, one minute, two minutes maximum. And he does, he rushes back in, burnt sausage fingers, and he fixes the valve. The concert can continue. There is that brief intermission though, where those listening do not hear anything. The problem is, now it's all fixed. Melba has finished. We can't possibly tell her that it's not been going out to anyone for the last two minutes. And Captain Round has a dilemma then. How do you get the world's most famous singer to keep on singing. It turns out incredibly easily. You just say encore. And he says quite simply, Madame Melba, the world is calling for more, are they? She says, and she does another five songs for him. Far more than the contract stipulated, but she's carried away now. She cannot help herself. And she concludes with the national anthem. Nineteen twenty, God save the king. Who could have a problem with this? Surely, the broadcast is a huge success. It's left the country, it's spanned Europe, and it's even left the continent. Well, some people do have a problem with it, including me, Peter Pendleton Eckersley. I tell you the problem I have with this. I'm trying to land planes. I've got planes trying to land on the village green. And they can't because all they can hear is opera. The Australian Nightingale. Wonderful, we welcome her to our shores, but may she fly away home so we can land our own birds, please. The mechanical variety on the Rittle Village Green. So no, fly away please, Madame Melba. And the government agree with me. Military in aviation purposes, that is what wireless is surely for for troops, for battles. We don't know when the next war may be. We've only just come back from the trenches and the first planes in flight, fighting wars and dropping bombs. We need to communicate them. This is not a toy, this is not entertainment. It's important and the government agree. And sure enough, our broadcast, my broadcast, the, the one that I foresaw in, in my memo of 1919 to Mr Marconi with the wireless concerts from the Albert Hall. We brought the Albert Hall to, to the packing shed and people have listened in their thousands and they loved it. But no, the government say it's not serious, it's not proper wireless communication. It must stop. And the experimental broadcasts, that's it. We have one or two more broadcasts, Lawrence Milky or Clara Butt. They do a few pieces, but that's it. That summer of 1920, that's it. It's over. The radio experiment is done with. And I, as publicity director of Marconi Company, have to find a new use for wireless. I, in, I'm literally at sea across the Atlantic Ocean on a press ship full of journalists, and I'm trying to sell them wireless radio as a use for communicating press room to press room to send news fast across the world and I'd nearly have them convinced except that I'm there for 15 minutes yelling into one of these trying to communicate with Paul Dew in Cornwall 
to gather information for the world's first ever ship's newspaper. I'm going to gather the news and then print it at sea and hand it around to show the press that this is how you can receive news now. But instead I'm shouting into the mouthpiece, hello Poldu, hello Cornwall, this is Burroughs, are you receiving me? And I hear nothing back. For 5, 10, 15 minutes, the room full of press is staring at me. Can you imagine a room full of about 50 people just staring at you? Yes, just like that. Well done. It's as if you were there. After 15 minutes, a voice does come through. We're off the Canadian coast from thousands of miles away. Not Cornwall, but Chelmsford. The familiar voice of Captain Round. Hello, Burroughs, he says. I understand you're trying to reach Cornwall. Well, they've been sworn to silence. A ship is in trouble in the channel and they need to not communicate with you. And it's as if a final reminder of the problem with broadcasting is that the government won't have us. Planes need to land and ships are in trouble and need to dock and need to communicate. And, and that's it. And in fact, the Chelmsford works, they stop their broadcast completely. Captain Round moves on. And, and I'm there at sea on this press ship trying to find a use for this technology. In fact, I brought some gramophone records with me and I send a few wireless messages to nearby ships and I ask for any requests and I get a few back and I play a few songs for the lads on the other ships, the other wireless sparks, the operators. It's almost the world's first all requests pirate radio station. One of the very popular songs is um, this one here. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's not that one there, that's nothing there. It's like Cornwall, it's like all over again, isn't it? It's uh, uh, DJ Arthur Burroughs here with the All Request uh, uh, Maritime Radio Show with uh, going out to all you ships at sea out there. It's Harry Lauder and Isla Valassi speaking right up to the vocal. Needs a bit of work, but you get the idea. Close, close, it's not bad, it's, it's not bad at all. But there you go. And we dock in Canada. 1920 comes to an end and there are no more broadcasts. 1921 starts, no more broadcasts. 1921 ends, no more broadcasts. Radio silence. 1922 begins, nearly two years have gone by with nothing. The Melba broadcast came to nothing. All there is is, is radio hams, these kind of hobbyists communicating with each other in a very low power way and it's all very well but lots of them are losing interest now in these radio sets they needed something to grab hold of after the war they needed a sense of peace and community and joy and, and togetherness and they thought they'd found it but they're starting to suspect that these radio sets don't even work anymore because they have no constant signal nothing to tune into to know that there's something there and so they petition the government and they say, look, could we just have one broadcast? One weekly half hour, 15 minutes of Morse code, 15 minutes of just basic human voice that we know will be there on a certain frequency at a certain half hour. And that's it. The rest of the week, nothing is fine. Just something that we can just check our sets are working. The government say no and they ask again and the government still say no and they make a big petition and eventually the government say, fine, okay, the Postmaster General in the Cabinet says, just to leave us alone, you can have one half hour on a Tuesday between 7 and 7.30, 15 minutes of Morse, 15 minutes of human speech. Every seven minutes, though, you close down for three minutes. I want to hear nothing in those three minutes at all, in case there are ships that need to dock and planes that need to land. We must look out for legitimate purposes, so he says. But... It's something. It's a start. It's a restart. My memo, maybe, will come to something. Regular broadcasting can begin, and the Marconi Company are the ones to do it. And the memo arrives, and surely I am the one to be able to do it. I've had the idea for it. I announced the Melba broadcast, and I'm so excited to see this message here to the Marconi Company that says, Dear Mr Eckersley, in addition to your designs work for the aircraft department, your team in Rittle are to set up a weekly broadcast for the purpose of calibrating wireless receiving sets. Oh, there are no extra funds for this, apparently. So it will have to be in your spare time on a Tuesday evening. We've set aside a pound a week, a pound a week for you in addition. Last of the big spenders. Please commence immediately on Tuesday next. The Postmaster General has allotted you the call sign of 2MT Rittle. Yours sincerely, Godfrey Isaacs, 
head of the Marconi company. Lads, we've got a job to do as well as designing air traffic control for Croydon. We've now got to do this thing called broadcasting. There's no money in it. It's an enforced hobby. We'll all hate it. We'll generally resent it. And oh, it gets worse. P.S. To oversee it from Marconi House in London, Arthur Burroughs will be your contact and send you artists and gramophone records. Marvellous gentlemen, it's worse than I thought. And yes, indeed, I will be all over this like a rash. They will not do broadcasting without me. If, they, if it has to be without me, I will make sure they do things properly. And so I start sending telegram after telegram to Mr. Eckersley. Dear Mr. Eckersley, Burroughs here, I understand that you, 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 are to be setting up our first regular broadcast service. Delighted to hear. I feel that in addition, though, to the, uh, the vocal tests and the Morse code, it would be wise to continue the musical programme that we attempted two years previously under Madame Melba, which you may recall I announced. Um, uh, so I'm sending, um, by train, a selection of gramophone records for you to play that I've carefully selected the higher side of culture. I'm also sending a gramophone player as well. Um, now, I've made a deal with the Cliftophone Gramophone Player Company. Um, essentially, if your team mentions Cliftophone in your Tuesday broadcast at least three times, they'll lease us the player for free, okay? Now, I know that'll be no mean feat because every seven minutes you've got to shut down for three. You've only got 50 minutes in total. But if you can mention Cliftophone basically every three minutes, you'll be fine. It will be on the train arriving in Chelmsford at 4.40 p.m. on Tuesday. Plenty of time for your evening broadcast. Good luck. Yours, Burroughs. My dear Mr. Burroughs, I appreciate your sentiments. Thank you for entrusting your precious medium of broadcasting to us little people here in Essex. See, we haven't got enough proper work to be doing. Sad news, the gramophone player didn't make it. Well, it made it off the train, um, but it didn't make it from... Chelmsford Station to the Rittle Hut. You see, I put it in my motorcycle sidecar, and then Harry Kirk, my biggest engineer, he put himself on the gramophone player. So the gramophone player didn't make it, but the gramophone records looked marvellous. Can't wait to hear them next time. We did instead find a singer, a Robert Howe is his name. Uh, it's not his real name, of course. He's a bit embarrassed to be associated with wireless broadcasting, and he has a contract with a record label who don't want him doing this. So as a pseudonym, Robert Howe, uh, decided he would sing for us and um, uh, you know on Tuesday evening yes it's meant the first musical performance on the first regular British broadcast and that first song was all together now the floral dance that's right there you go so uh, yeah it's uh Oh, yeah. and, and better impressions. Uh, well, it's... Well, my dear Mr. Eckersley, I did enjoy Mr. Howe, Mr. Wogan, and his floral dance. I should enjoy it even more if the equipment that I send you makes it off the train, off the motorcycle and sidecar, into the Rittle Hut without problem. I will arrange for a second gramophone player to be sent to you, you may have to mention Cliftophone six times an hour, but it will be worth it. I would accompany it myself, as I did Madame Melba, but I have not been granted leave by my boss at the Marconi Company, Mr Isaacs, or my boss at home, Mrs Burroughs. Please be careful with this player, yours, Burroughs. My dear Mr Burroughs, if you heard Tuesday's broadcast, you will know good and bad news. The good news is the player arrived intact. The bad news, the records didn't. Well, we took them to the pub, you see, for the pre-show planning meeting. We had a look through a few of them. We didn't like them. We threw them out the window. Um, but we kept a few of them. For example, this one here. This is 2FT Riddle Calling. 2FT Riddle Calling. And now here is a gramophone player who is telling you that the record will be played on the The thing is that all along, <clears throat> my team has been doing this because I'm the only member of my team who's married and so I set them up and they go and meet in the pub and they decide before the programme on a Tuesday evening what they'll say and what they'll play and 
and I go home and I listen in at home with Mrs Eckersley while we're having a little bit of dinner. And uh, two or three weeks in, I listen in and I think this is all very well, but it's a little, a little staid, a little dull, a little boring. Um, and not only that, my team keep on saying, well, here is another record that's entitled. I think, why are records always entitled something? I mean, I should be entitled, not the record. So what I do is the next week, I go along and I join their pre-show planning meeting in the pub. And I buy them some fish and some chips and, and a few glasses of gin. And then a few more glasses of gin. And I make sure that they're drinking that gin while I sneak out rather quickly and I race down the lane before they do, and I get to the microphone before any of them, and for the first time, I, Captain Peter Pendleton Eckersley, pick up the microphone, and I start speaking. <clears throat> hello, hello, this is Peter Pendleton Eckersley here. This is 2MT Rittle, 2 talk Rittle calling, 2 talk Rittle calling, Ooh. Um, and uh, this evening, we have for you our usual programme, which of, ah, which of course is meant to commence with 15 minutes of Morse, and uh, I've leapt straight in with the voice. Well, that's unfortunate. Oh, well, beep, 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 beep. There we go, that's the Morse for you. Um, and we have some records, as ever, for you. Uh, some of these records are entitled, some are not entitled at all. Don't know quite what's going on there exactly. We had a singer that we were going to present to you this evening, but, uh, well, she failed. You know what singers are like. You know, they, they just fail. You can't trust a single one of them, can you? You know them, don't you? I tell you what, lean in. Lean in to your, your radio sets, your devices. Clamp those headphones ever closer to your ears. If you're listening as a family, maybe with the headphones in a pudding bowl to amplify around the room, gather a little closer. For I wish to tell you a story this evening. Not only a story, but I think a few dirty jokes. What do you think about that? And I, oh, I've just noticed that I was meant to close down for three minutes after seven minutes, and I haven't, so apologies, but what are you gonna do about it? Is the Postmaster General listening? I don't think so. Cliftophone, 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 cliftophone. Good, that's another one for free for us. And I go on, and on, and on. And nearly an hour later, I hang up the microphone, and I look up, and I see my team has come back from the pub. And they're looking at me, and I'm saying, Oh, what, oh, did I say that? Oh, did I? Oh, dear. Well, that sounds terrible. Oh, dear. That's, they won't allow us on again next week, will they? Thinking maybe we can get back to some air traffic control design, but no, but no. The next day, we receive a letter, sure enough, from... My dear Mr. Eckersley, stop. Please, just stop. Just, we've come too far. We've risked too much. We've ca they've cancelled culture for us. And that may catch on again in a few decades' time, you never know. The, the Melbourne broadcast was it for nearly two years. The government wanted no more. And we, we've, we must adhere to the rules. You must close down after seven minutes. You must do the morse. You must behave yourself. You must not tell those rude jokes anymore. No! Stop! But we received several hundred other telegrams and postcards saying, We loved it! Do it again! And so next week, we do... Do it again. And uh, we go, hello, this is Tumor Talk Rittle calling. Tumor Talk Rittle calling. Uh, this is Peter Eckersley here. How are you this evening? Gather in closely. For tonight, once again, I shall tell you a story. Not only that, tonight we will receive Rome. Oh, yes, indeed. They said it couldn't be done. They said it shouldn't be done. Technically, it can't be done. But oh, we're receiving them now. <laughs> hello, this is Radio Czechoslovakia speaking. Uh, hello, hello, this is France. Hello, uh, it's Rome. this is Rome. Ah, there, there you go, we now hear Rome. And we will present for you a night of opera. Yes, indeed, the world's first full-length opera broadcast by one person doing all the instruments and voices. Oh, yes. Oh, Salemia. Gather round, everybody, gather. And this goes on and on and on. And somebody, of course, isn't happy. <laughs> My precious medium. It should be for the higher side of culture. It should be for the arts, for poetry, for, for music, good music, proper music. And the government should be obeyed at all times. And other companies then decide that, unfortunately, because this is rather working out and people now want to buy radio sets, what really kills me as director of publicity is he is publicising wireless far better than I can. And people are listening in now. They are buying radio sets. We're no longer just on the letters to the editor's page. 
we're growing through the newspapers and metropolitan vicars up in Manchester are rivals. They want to get it up. They want, they petition to start a radio station themselves and the government allow it. 2ZY Manchester is to start in the northwest. We have 2MT in Rittle. I therefore think maybe there should be more radio stations. Some are turned down. Of course, the Daily Mail. They, yes, they apply for a radio station. The government say no. It would be too powerful if a newspaper were to also have a radio station. And of course, that will always be the case until eventually the times are changing. But for now, the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, they try as well. Years later, in fact, the Daily Mail do finally get a sort of radio station because the government won't allow it. They hire a small boat off the east coast of England and send messages in in one of the first real pirate ship broadcasts. But they have such a low power transmitter, they essentially reach one pedalo. Doesn't really work for them, but bless them. I'm sure they're not the type to hold a grudge, though, against the broadcasters for the next hundred years. Um, and other people want to broadcast. But this is not America. In America, radio stations crop up and pop out the ground like mushrooms. Everyone wants to sell something over there. But we are a small island nation. So eventually the Postmaster General says, enough. Stop applying for broadcast licenses. We've got Eckersley in Essex. And it turns out he's rather popular. That thing of ships not being able to dock doesn't matter. The ships couldn't dock because everyone in the dock is listening to Eckersley on the radio. If a plane wants to land, they'd rather listen to Eckersley than land, it turns out. So he's everywhere. We've got 2ZY Manchester just starting up. And I wonder if there's room for one more broadcast station from the Marconi Company in London. Arthur Burroughs, surely the person to be director of programmes. We apply and we are granted. And in May of 1922, London 2LO begins. 2LO London Calling. All I need to do now is plan what my first broadcast for that will be. And to do that, I think I may need an interval. As I know, do you. So uh, there are refreshments, I believe there's a bar, there are, there, are, there, are, there are toilets as well, somewhere, if not there's a garden. And um, we also have a fine display of old genuine uh, radio artefacts, radio sets, microphones. Um, Tim Wonder has some marvellous books on radio history. Um, I have a couple of books, not on radio history, but on the history of Christmas, um, and a memoir as well. Um, it's nearly Christmas, go with it. Um, if it's 1920, it can also be nearly Christmas. Um, and we'll have an interval for 15 minutes. How about that? Does that sound all right to you? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Georges Carpentier is in the ring, and 
Kid Lewis is dancing around him, wearing a fetching purple dressing gown, fit for a sultan. And, uh, okay, oh, and ding ding, and they're, and they're off, here we go, and Georges Carpentier has punched Kid Lewis. Georges Carpentier has knocked out Kid Lewis. <laughs> And that is the end of the boxing match. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had nothing else planned for this evening. So this is London 2 and 0 closing down now. Tomorrow I will have to remember to bring some gramophone records to play you, uh, using our special Cliftophone gramophone player. Cliftophone. Closing down. Well, I don't know if you heard the boxing commentary from Tuolo the other night. Did you hear it? Bless Arthur Burroughs for trying. We all know that the only duel you want to hear is Essex versus London. <laughs> MT versus Tuolo. Peter the Beast Eckersley versus Arthur Bugger Burroughs. Can we say bugger? Oh, <laughs> I can't say bugger. Oh, I've been told I'm not allowed to say bugger. I've just been given a long list of all the words I'm not allowed to say, and I will read them to you. Bloody <laughs> balls! <laughs> oh, I'm uh, closing down now. Closing down. Closing down. Well, um, uh, it's uh, two hello, London calling. Arthur Burroughs here. Two hello, London. London calling. Now we bring you some an evening of poetry and music and the higher side of the arts, as ever. Uh, a favourite poet of mine is Longfellow, and I will. Close down the program now, which night with a favourite poem of Longfellow. Uh, the night shall be filled with music, and the cares that beset the day shall fold their tents and silently fade away. You see, and by taking the microphone away from my mouth, I may enact a fading motion. I'm sure you approve. Innovation, always here, as ever. And we have a concert now. Uh, Miss Beatrice Evelyn will play the cello for you. And, uh, and we have some letters of communication, which is a lovely thing to have. Thank you. For, do send your telegrams to us at Marconi House in London. Uh, telegram here. Uh, Dear Arthur Burroughs of Tuolo, we love listening to London Tuolo. Thank you very much indeed. But would you mind not broadcasting on a Tuesday so we can listen to Peter Eckersley take the mic out of you? No, no, that is not the sort of communication we desire. Please do send us supportive, uh, positive encouragement. Uh, we, 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 we thank you. Uh, two MT River calling, two top River calling. Did you, did you hear Arthur Burroughs? Bless him. I think he's a little frightened. I think he's a little uh, perturbed that we're giving the rise to him a little. Um, so we won't do that for some time, for at least the first five minutes. Instead, we will have the first radio quiz. Oh, yes, indeed. So I will like, give you some quiz questions. You can send in telegrams of your answers. And then I'm thinking we'll do the first radio play. Cyrano de Bergerac. I've got my engineers here. I will play Cyrano, of course. My assistant, Rollswin, will play the rustling leaves. There you go, that was the rustling leaves. And um, we're also delighted to welcome the local children as well from the, the town. They're going to come and sit down in front of us. We'll have a whole little gang show here, that'll be lovely. I've had a communication as well from one listener who's particularly taken by my voice, it would seem. Uh, she said she's going to send around a Rolls Royce for me and collect me and take me to who knows where. Um, so, Mrs. Eckersley, I will be home later, I promise you. Two uh, empty, closing down, now closing down. Uh, two hello, London calling, two hello, London calling. Uh, we never stop innovating. No, no, sorry, never stop innovating, two hello, London. For tonight, we will bring you, yes, as a public service, because we think the public service broadcasting is the future. As a public service, many of you wish to know the time. And if you do not have watches or clocks, maybe you need to hold the time prove that this is coming to you live from London. And so, the time is coming up to, well, well, wouldn't it be lovely if we could broadcast for you Big Ben's Bongs? Unfortunately, we can't. Um, it's just too far from our Coney house to hear, and very frustratingly as well, 2ZY in Manchester, in Manchester, run by the Metropolitan Vicars Company, well, they have an office at Metrovic in Westminster. And an enterprising employee of that office the other day uh, telephoned the Manchester studio of 2ZY just before the hour, stuck the telephone handset out of the window, and all of the people in Manchester could hear Big Ben's bombs, while unfortunately in London, you can't. We're not close enough. So I'm rather frustrated by that. But instead, to make up for it, I've hired the tubular bells of the London Symphony Orchestra. They're before me now. 
And as it comes up to 7 o'clock, I can tell you that the time is approaching 7 o'clock. This is London calling. <laughs> London calling. Yeah, very nice. Mm -hmm. Ah, well, I don't know if you heard the time signal the other day. This is 2 o'clock written calling, of course, Essex, hello. Um, Peter Eckersley. Um, did you hear in London, they were doing the time signal, bless them, attempting to imitate Big Ben's balls? Well, we can imitate the imitation. Oh, yes, I've spent all day driving around every scrap metal dealership I can find in the Chelmsford area, and I've collected all the pots and pans and broken glass and bits of old bicycles in front of me, and I've got a couple of sticks, and the time has gone up to 6.56 and a half precisely, and so it's time for this. <laughs> oh, you've broken wine bottles. Oh, <laughs> covered in alcohol, but same as it ever was, eh? You know what it's like around here. And this goes on all summer long. We broadcast, and Peter Eckersley takes the mickey out of us, and we broadcast again, and it continues and continues. He forgets completely that this is meant to be a serious medium, that we are experimenting here, and we are paving the way for the future. Because yes, there are other people applying to broadcast, the Postmaster General says, there is no more room. We have Essex 2MT, we have London 2LO, we have Manchester 2ZY, and everybody else needs to stop. And so the Postmaster General says to the, the wireless manufacturers, Marconi's and Metrovic and Western Electric and General Electric and British Thomson Houston, he gathers them together and says, look, you all want to do this thing called broadcasting that we don't fully understand. But I'm not going to give licenses to all of you. I'm going to give just one or two broadcast licenses to one or two companies. And for a while, that's what they think they might do. Two companies. Uh, one in the north and one in the south. Uh, an, an SBC, Southern Broadcasting Company, and an NBC, a Northern Broadcasting Company. But then there are all sorts of difficulties. Where does it stop? What's Birmingham? It's sort of in the middle. And who's going to get the patents? And eventually, several meetings in. Godfrey Isaacs, the Marconi Company boss, says, listen, we, the Marconi Company, we know best of all what we're doing. We will share the patents with all of you other wireless manufacturers. We'll work together. How about we'll have one boss of each company, we'll make a board of directors of, of one broadcasting company, and we, the Marconi Company, will build the other five radio stations that the government think we need to fill the country. So Cardiff and Bournemouth and, and Glasgow and Newcastle. Well, the Marconi Company are the ones to be trusted to build these stations. And we'll share what we know with you. And we'll call this uh, the Broadcasting Company. And the man taking the minutes, Frank Gill, he writes Broadcasting Company. And then he adds in pen afterwards the word, the word British in front of Broadcasting, because that sounds a little better. Two lines down on the same page, he's the first person to use the word pirates in association with uh, those broadcasting without a license, who shouldn't be, shouldn't be broadcasting. I can, I can think of one person who shouldn't be broadcasting, and he's not a pirate as such, but he's in a field, in a hut, in Essex. I think it's time for him to stop as we approach the end of 1922. But no, I will not be stopped. This is too much talk riddle calling, too much talk riddle calling. We are delighted to continue receiving you. We, uh, we have many more uh, wonderful uh, uh, guest artists sent to us, Arthur Burroughs. He's still sending us guest artists, you know, and we'll still put them on now and then occasionally when we can be bothered. And unfortunately, one guest artist, this lovely, beautiful lady, beautiful singing voice, she comes in and, and she sings for us and she asks if we forward on any letters and postcards of appreciation. We say that we will. Unfortunately, we can't forward any on because every single postcard we receive says, Dear Mr. Eckersley, that was your best impersonation yet. <laughs> you sounded just like a woman. And it was a woman, that's the thing. So <laughs> we just say they got lost in the post, unfortunately. But no, we, we, we keep on broadcasting as we go into the autumn of 1922. We keep on, we keep on putting the messages out there and we, we get occasional letters like this one from Mrs. Trellis in North Wales. And uh, Oh no, we read that one out last time. Well, if you, if you have any more letters, do send them to us, because we're not entirely sure if you're still listening or not. 
out there in Ripple and beyond. And gradually, I wonder if they are listening indeed, because they don't need to be listening. Ripple's job has been done. It's decided that the British Broadcasting Company will be the sole broadcaster in the country. From, uh, we'll have London, uh, to Tuolo, we'll have Manchester, 2ZY, we'll absorb them as well. We'll set up a new station in Birmingham, 5IT, and that's all we need for now. We'll start the other radio stations in the next few months or years, the Cardiff, the Glasgow, the Newcastle. But do we need Essex? I don't think so. They play a different game to the rest of us. And so we, we leave them for now. We go into September. We start a giant exhibition promoting wireless sets, encouraging people to buy Marconi phones to listen at home and pay for the privilege. It's decided that to fund broadcasting, <coughs> there will be a, a small royalty from the sale of these sets. And given that that will be a one-off fee and that won't really support financially broadcasting, there's to be a, a license, a, list, a receiving license uh, that you can pay to annually to listen to your radio sets. And I'm sure that this, this license fee will be incredibly popular. Uh, I'm sure there'll be no issues with that whatsoever for the next century at least. Um, so there's a real radio license, there's a license fee. Uh, so the final issue really is to do with news, how to keep the press on side. Eventually it's decided that we will not gather news, we will broadcast news, we will read what has been gathered for us by one of the press agencies, uh, Reuters, for example. And that way, we're not in great competition with the newspapers who do gather news, and we will only read the news after seven o'clock in the evening. That way people have the day to go and buy their newspapers, and we should not affect newspaper sales, although the newspaper proprietors are a little suspicious of that, certainly to begin with. And that means that we are all set, pretty much, that November arrives, the license fee is in place, the press have agreed with writing news, London, Birmingham, and Manchester are to start broadcasting. And first of all, it is to be London calling. Cool. Company in Corning. This is Tuolo, the London station of the British Broadcasting Company Corning. This is Arthur Burroughs, the Director of Programmes at Tuolo. Uh, we are broadcasting on behalf of the Broadcasting Committee on the 360 metre wavelength from London Marconi House, the Strand. This evening's broadcast will consist of a weather report followed by a news bulletin, which I will read first at a standard speed and I will then repeat it at a much slower speed. <laughs> Tuolo welcomes correspondence from listeners in in order to discover which speed the news bulletins should be read. It may be that I read too slowly for listeners in to remember the context. <coughs> Please do send telegrams as to whether you would prefer the bulletins to be read once slowly, or once fast, and then once slowly, or indeed, should I read each news bulletin fast twice? Experience will furnish the best average speed, and time will tell. A second bulletin will follow at 9 p.m. Uh, there will be no music this evening. That will follow tomorrow, along with the Birmingham and Manchester stations. And also, we'll tomorrow bring you the results of the general election as we receive them here at the transmitting station. There now follows the weather report. The South and South East England, East and West Midlands, and South Wales are supplied by the Meteorological Department of the Air Ministry. Like winds, maybe northeasterly, fog inland early. The further outlook, generally safe. Stand by for the news. First copyright news from Reuters Press Association, exchange in central news. Polling in the general election takes place tomorrow. The Prime Minister, Mr. Bona Law, making his final election speech in Glasgow today, said he had confidence that the Unionist Party would gain a working majority. The Prime Minister also said that he would deliver and deliver and deliver, <laughs> though no one fully knows that means. <laughs> a first folio of Shakespeare has been sold at auction today for an undisclosed sum. Should it be disclosed before 9pm, we will update you then. 
Today's billiards uh, tournaments are still in play. At first, it was the current champion, Mr. Newman, who was completely out of form this afternoon, scoring only 11 points. Matches remain in play. And now the travel. Uh, omnibuses in western and northeastern London uh, have been led through the streets by conductors today due to the aforementioned thick fog enveloping London. There are uh, roadworks as well, all around the major A roads, due to the fact that they are still being built. <laughs> that concludes the first bulletin. This is 2LO calling, the British Broadcasting Company, London Station calling. And now, for the sake of those who have missed the bulletin, or if you wish to hear it again, I will repeat it at a much slower speed. But first, as seven minutes have elapsed, I will now cease transmitting for three minutes to listen for government messages as per the terms of our license. And it continues. We are underway. British broadcasting has officially begun. In London and the next night in, in Birmingham and Manchester and yet still in Essex, <laughs> it continues. Oh yes, this is 2MT Ritual calling, 2 o'clock Ritual calling. Did you hear that BBC? Can't see it lasting that long, can you? <laughs> no, me neither. I have been asked, will I be applying for a job today? Well, as you may know, the applications have been coming in because the job advertisements have been in the technical press. There is a, there's be four employees to begin with. They're looking for a general manager, uh, a director of programs, a secretary, and a chief engineer. Well, it's not for me to go joining the official British Broadcasting, not when unofficial British Broadcasting is so much fun. So, those dirty jokes once again. Um, but meanwhile, of course, I am a shoo-in for Director of Programs, uh, and so as well as being the voice of 2 in London, I apply and gain the job of Director of Programs. I join the Secretary, uh, Mr. Anderson, and there is to be a, a Chief Engineer who has cold feet early on, so he only lasts for one day because he thinks this British Broadcasting Company won't last. As for the general manager, it's offered to a notable journalist who turns it down, again thinking broadcasting won't last. It's then offered to the postmaster general, formerly, who lost his seat in the general election on the second night of the BBC. And we think that maybe he would like to head up this BBC, but he also turns it down, thinking again there's no money in it. So the third candidate is a Scot. Tall man with a scar on his cheek called Wreath. The name is Wreath. And uh, yes, I do feel qualified uh, to lead this British broadcasting company because I feel qualified to lead anything. <laughs> and um, uh, why should you hire me? Well, well, Sir William Noble, taking this job into you, there is one very good reason why you should hire me, and that is that uh, I'm an Abedonian, as are you. And my father knows your father. And when can I start? Monday. Thank you very much. Do I have any questions? I have one question. What is broadcasting? <laughs> I do not have a radio set. And I spend the weekend explaining to Mr. Reith what broadcasting is. I draw many diagrams. Like something, I think he's quite surprised to hear that we'll need more than four roles at this British broadcasting company. So we are to go on a hiring spree with all of the the roles that I suggest for him. We spent the weekend looking for premises. We decided that uh, it's a lovely property at Savoy Hill that will do the job, but it's not ready for a few months yet. So for now, we stay in a one-room BBC in Magnet House on loan to us from Western Electric. It's a short walk to Marconi House, where I still broadcast. I spend the day as director of programmes. I run through the streets to broadcast of an evening at Marconi House on the seventh floor. And not only that, on the seventh floor, it's decided that because we're actually operating all this time out of a small training cinema where people keep turning up, Marconi engineers keep thinking they're going to watch training films, while I'm broadcasting on the air, I need a light of some sort. Some kind of red light to say, broadcasting is happening here. Captain Brown designs one for me, and he even puts some letters in front of it, so that that way everybody knows exactly what we're doing there, and I'm sure that that might work quite fantastically. In fact, Captain Brown comes back and designs us a whole new microphone for official broadcasting. It's out with the old and it's in with the new as Captain Round shows us that actually we can broadcast further and wider and in greater clarity. Just like those original voice tests that he was doing with the railway timetables, we can increase the power and the quality of what we do. John Reed's first instruction to me is to hire a vicar for Christmas. And so we do. Christmas Eve, 1922, 
Reverend John Mayo gives the first religious broadcast on official British broadcasting. I have just come from my church in Whitechapel, a great church situated in the midst of all the noise and the turmoil and the dust and the slum and all that Whitechapel can do. And it is my privilege by the aid of the ministry of Mr. Marconi in this wonderful house to speak as I understand to many thousands of people. Surely no man has ever proclaimed the gospel from such an extraordinary pulpit as I am now occupying. And, well, Peter Pendleton Eckersley, two of the top Brit will call him, if anyone is still picking up and listening, but uh, did you hear the vicar on the BBC the other night giving the last rites to the BBC, I should say, <laughs> seeing off their official enterprise. And, oh, we have had a letter, someone is still listening, we've had a letter from Mrs Trellis from North Wales, I think she may be the only one that's still <laughs> listening. But we go into the new year in any case, because I hear that there are developments at the BBC, because things have to change. And sure enough, as we go into the new year, once again with the vicar heralding the new year for us, we have a sign on our door at Magnet House saying, BBC, come in. Anyone can come in and pitch an idea for broadcasting. One person asks if we can broadcast to Mars to communicate with aliens. We say our transmitter barely reaches Croydon, but we'll give it a go. <laughs> but someone else comes in with a much better idea. He's the chief engineer of the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden, just a stone's throw away, a quarter of a mile away from Marconi House. And he wonders, with opera season coming up, if maybe we can broadcast live from the Opera House. And I explain that we had this issue before with Madame Melbourne, that the transmitter is the size of the wall in the forum of North Wood House. But actually, we decide that we know what went wrong last time. There's not to be another fire. The cable won't stake through a flame all the way through the quarter mile of the London streets. No, we can monitor the power going through it, and therefore we try it. And within two days, we have laid a cable from Marconi House through central London onto the stage of the Royal Opera House, a quarter of a mile away. And on Monday, the 8th of January, the first outside broadcast takes place from the opera, the magic flute, a tale by Mozart of someone who first is fearful of the community and mocks them, but ultimately joins them. And I listen to this, this opera. I'm listening to it because I'm ready to mock it, probably by doing another mock opera on Turin T. Rittenall. But I'm struck by it, and it's not the singing, it's not the opera. I've heard opera before, I've, I've imitated opera before. No, it's before the opera. I can hear the audience of this first outside broadcast. I can hear the rustle of papers, I can hear the tap of the conductor's baton, I can hear the tuning up of the orchestra, and suddenly, for the first time, I get it. I understand the magic and the power of broadcasting. I've been mocking the BBC, I've been complaining about Madame Melba's broadcast stopping planes land. But when I listen to this first outside broadcast of the Opera House, I am transported. It's like I'm there in the stools. And I suddenly realize a penny drops and my world implodes. I realize that wireless radio can transport you anywhere in the world. It can be a light shone in the darkness. It can transmit and transport you to war zones across the world, deserts, the Arctic, wherever you want to be, you can be with the power of radio. And I suddenly realise that me mocking it in Essex is no longer helpful. And I say to my team, I'm sorry, that's it, I'm going. I phone Mr Reith, and in the course of one meeting, I offer to close down 2MT Riffle. And I also say, do you need a chief engineer? And he does. And so by February, I've joined them this BBC. That is how we close 2MT Riffle. The sound of a champagne cork. Actually, it's a pop gun. But <laughs> how else could we close 2MT Riffle but with an innovative sound effect? A glass of water as a toast upgraded to a bit of fizz to close out the nearly a year that we broadcast from 2 Emmatock in Riffle and changed radio and modern media as we know it. And I joined the BBC, I say goodbye to my team in Riffle, 
they can't believe that I'm going to join this ragtag bunch of BBC people, and I'll be reading out stock market prices and, and, and there to support Arthur Burroughs. Oh, Arthur Burroughs, of course, he's still there, and he still does his little poem to fade out. He still walks away. The night should be filled with music and the cares that beset the But now that I'm in the room with him, I can put a bit of string behind him, and the last thing you hear of the Sunday broadcast is a thud as Arthur Burroughs hits the floor at the end of his poem. Yes, he may have stopped me broadcasting, but now he's stuck with me, and that's the way it goes. So, as we enjoy, or endure, or loathe, or tolerate, or am baffled by the BBC in its hundredth year, as it celebrates its centenary, now and then, spare a thought for those pioneers who made it all possible. That is another story. But spare a thought for Arthur Burroughs, Thus, the British Broadcasting Company came into being. Nobody could tell to what extent broadcasting would catch on, nor indeed whether it would take on at all. And it was all left to us. If only people would see their jobs, if only people would see their lives in terms of its humour, of its excitement, if we could only see that the thing that we do is a God-given thing for heaven's sake because it's creative and it's fun and it's exciting. That pioneer adventure was born in laughter, was nurtured in laughter, and died in laughter. Thank you, Queen. But um, basically, um, a lot of this show is largely based on books, um, and any book you can find on uh, the Marconi and broadcasting story that is not written by Tim Wonder, somewhere in the preface or the thanks, it says, and thanks to Tim Wonder for helping with the research for this book. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you, Tim. Cheers. Well, thank you, Paul. What a great evening. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Two hours. I've told this story many times, often at some great length, I think two and a bit hours last time, and it's always a bit dry, and I think Paul brought it to life. I've lived with some of these people for 40 years, and we're just about to embark on a biography of this amazing man, Peter Eckersley. I'm, I'm researching with his granddaughters and his personal archives. Perhaps it's worth just taking a little, as we sit in the 100th year, BBC 100, BBC are not doing as much as we'd hoped. And there are many reasons for that, we'll tell you that later, <laughs> probably. Um, there are some doors the BBC don't want to open about their past, is that true? I think it's fair That's to say. Fair to I say think it's they're nervous. I think they're nervous. nervous. They may find but <coughs> suffice to say that with Eckersley and Burroughs and Reeves at the BBC, what happens next is mind blowing. Bear in mind that when I opened the, the evening, this is only 20 years, 22 years later since the young Guillermo Marconi stood at Tony B. Hall and said, my name is Mark Coney, I've invented the radio. He comes to the Isle of Wight to put this experiment into practical use. By 1925, we have a nationwide broadcasting station where 98% of the population can hear radio on at least two frequencies. It is going to spawn a mass manufacturing industry. You'll see some radios outside there. Thousands of jobs. In fact, it's going to spawn an revolution in electronic and electrical mass manufacturer, which will stand us in good stead, because of course in 1939 we're going to go back to war, and by this time radio and radar, and radar is born out of the birth of television, because that's what television was for 10 years, all developed initially by Peter Eckersley in 1928 the BBC, who first said John Logie Baird's mechanical ideas won't work, we need a guy called Isaac Schoenberg to develop an electronic system. It was going to show Mickey Mouse in the 1930s, but in fact it was actually developing radar. You've never heard of Schoenberg? Because of two reasons. A, it was top secret, and B, he was Jewish, and his family was in Nazi-occupied Germany. And we never learn. What is amazing about this period is that the pioneers at Riddle will define the art and science of radio for the next generation. Eckersley, as beautifully recreated by 
my friend Paul, is in fact a member of the Goon Shows, but in 1922 none of them were alive yet. It is the forerunner of Monty Python and everything in the comedy which is more Paul Well. Perhaps we're going to take some questions now, but Arthur Burroughs falls out of love with me, you see. Yeah, I'm, one of the things I, I, I read, I went, uh, some of this was actually, I went to the Written Archive Centre in Caversham, the BBC Written Archive Centre, and you could see oh, the... Thursday. He's there Thursday, there you go, the, the, the seat's waiting for you. But um, you could see the telegrams, the, um, the memos there, that Burroughs, although he's the first voice of the BBC and the first director of programmes, and wrote that memo to Marconi and all those sorts of things, as soon as it started, he very quickly went off air and found other people in his place to be an announcer. He was very keen to get off air um, and be in the back room there, really. But you also get that sense that from Arthur Lewis and a very important person we've not mentioned, Cecil, sort of Arthur Burroughs and Cecil Lewis, deputy director, Arthur Burroughs number two, um, that, that actually they liked it when the BBC was 10 people. And that as soon as Reith kept hiring and saying it needs 40 people, 50 people, that suddenly there's a sense that, oh, it's got a bit carried away. And they would not recognise the BBC as we know today. But Arthur Burroughs didn't last long, did he? It was 1925. He moves on. He moves on to start the international broadcasting set frequencies. But our friend Peter Eckersley, PPE, he's going to stay at the BBC as the chief engineer. The day he joins, he knew he was the chief engineer because he was the only engineer in a little cupboard under the stairs. He will leave in 1929. When he leaves, <laughs> that's a whole other story. He's built the BBC to now have an engineering department of over 730 people. There are 10 major, re station, 10 major broadcast stations in the city, including Ireland, 10 relay stations, and the whole population can hear radio as some two or three channels, different ch frequencies for Scotland, different programmes that are now regionally organised. So indeed, by 1926, he starts a regional scheme, which we will still recognise today. He then does the same for Australia, America, tries it in America, it doesn't work. Eckersley also starts in 1927 the long wave broadcasting station because the BBC World Service wants to produce its voice across the world. Now bear in mind that this person, Eckersley, he has quite an interesting background. We won't do much in detail, but a, mom, a life most lived, he's already a World War I fighter pilot radio developer, he's been installing radio craft, and he's responsible for the birth of civil aviation. You're going to get to Heathrow and Gatwick this year. That comes from Eckersley. He will drive to MT Ritual and the BBC, uh, to Ed Ritual, to give birth to the BBC. It wouldn't have happened without him. He then goes to the BBC and builds the British Broadcasting Station to what we know now. And his story is not yet over. He will leave the BBC in 1929 because he believes you should broadcast over cables. In 1931, he wrote a paper that says, imagine I'm sat in a chair, I can look at a screen. There must be television screens. And in my arm piece, I've got buttons. And I can change between three programs. If I want to watch a football scores, I press a button. If I want to watch the tennis, I can press a button. If I want to watch the football from yesterday, I can press a button. That technology is not in existence 50 years, old, 50 years, but Eckersley saw it coming. He's going to form a company called Radio Fusion. The BBC will put him out of business. He is going to go over to Germany in 1935, ostensibly recruited by the Nazis to build their main broadcasting station. We now know he's working for MI6. If this is not enough, he is now a spy on the edge of the Gestapo for two and a half years, reporting back what Joseph Goebbels is doing with 80 million receivers. He's going to take a nation to war with the power of radio, 30 years after Mark only came to the Isle of Wight. They didn't listen to Eckersley, and the world went to war. Eckersley gets all out of Nazi Germany by the skin of his teeth. His handler was a guy called Maxwell Knight in MI6. Well, you know him as M. He shares an office with a guy called Ian Fleming. I don't wonder where that goes. One other piece of Eckersley is, we lose Eckersley in World War II. The problem is, his new wife is actually joining the Nazi party. We now find him in 1942, and he's going to lead the Black Propaganda Network, 
transmitting all the propaganda back to Germany using radio skills he's learned over the years, but more importantly, as we go to war, as we go back to Europe, and you saw the invasion ships out in 1944, there's a thing called Operation Bodyguard, a massive program of deception to convince the Germans that we're not going to hit Normandy, we're going to hit the back lane. The chief engineer, Peter Pendleton Eckersley. A lot of positive? Mm, absolutely. I think it's all there. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, that, that brings you up to date with the birth of radio and BBC 100. <coughs> One question I was asked, which was a very good question, gentlemen over here, and, and Paul says, and we forget because we lived with it for many years, the call signs, 2LO, 2MT, where did they come from? Why? Was it? Well, it's a, the short version is, at the birth of radio with the Morse code, the call signs, the ships, because it was many ships, were three letters. The ship that left here in April 1912, its call sign was MGY, the Titanic. Morse code, 30, 40 words a minute, always MGY appears at the beginning and the end of the message, CQ, CQ, DE, MGY. As we get into broadcasting, there are so many radio amateurs who want their own licenses, they run out of three letters. Also internationally, stations in Paris want to use PAR for Paris. So they come to a convention very early on which says that we're going to have two as our first number and then two letters. Now those letters were actually randomly issued, but if you had a certain pull, like Mr. Marconi, 2LO for 2 London, 2MT, 2 Marconi testing, um, which was better because their original call sign was 2PO and that never worked. <laughs> so it's like personalised number plates, I guess. Isn't it's it? personalised number plate. By the time they get to Newcastle and Birmingham, they've run out of twos, so guess what? They use fives. Those call signs go through such that by the time I became a radio amateur in 1979, I'm actually G6GUX, that's how anoraki I am, but they'd actually run out of sixes and three letters and have to put a G in front of it. Even then they've used them all up now as an MW. But it's just really a personalised number plate that goes back. Um, some of them are random, some of them are special to the call signs, and indeed the two stations on the side of 2MT were just per private people playing amateur radio. So before, because I know you all want to get home, any questions for, for the star of the show, Paul, or the air out saying in the corner? <laughs> yeah. I, I have one, and it might be slightly unfair. <laughs> but the BBC, where do we go now? That's a good question. <laughs> if we knew that. Yeah, I think it's... Um, it's, it's a, well, I think part of that question is, of course, dependent on, you know, if we've got a new culture secretary as of a few hours ago, I guess, um, a day ago, um, Nadine Dorries and uh, the cabinet there, they had a plan, and that may still happen, but I think certainly the headline of what she said, this is the last license been doing with the BBC, I think it probably will be. I think, you know, the next few years, um, you know, it's been, they've said it for ages, but with the, the state of modern media, uh, they need to find a different way of, of, of operating and funding, I guess. And, um, and I, I work for the BBC as a sitcom writer and as a local radio presenter, and I, I'm freelance, so I've worked for them. I'm sort of, I'm, I'm loyal in that I like working with them for them. I'm not the Director General, so I don't have a sort of, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I've, no, I'm not staff, but that way. But I'd like to see it continue, I'd like to see it um, improve because they've promised it. it won't just stop. It won't be like there's no more BBC, it will just, the lack of funding will make it weaker. And you can already see the news, we've got two news channels, the World, World News and the News Channel, they're merging, which essentially means the domestic news won't be in about February next year. We'll have World News and you won't have the News Channel, which means people will switch off, they go watch Sky News, ITN, whatever it might be. Um, CBBC, the talk about taking off terrestrial TV, and it just it erodes it. So it needs it needs a, a fire rocket uh, under. I think. I think, it, it, uh, and as a historian who does only a little bit of work for the BBC, the problem how you fund a British broadcasting company is it echoed through the years. It was a it was it, it drove Isaacs and then an Eckersley mad through the 1920s. I mean, the battle in 1925 to make the BBC independent of government. At that point, they were they were head to head with no no lesser person than Winston Churchill, who wanted to make BBC a, a, the voice of the government. And, and Reith and Eckersley actually set up the transmitter in Reith's house. Uh, and then, of course, you go to the general strike, and then the BBC becomes a corporation in 1927. 
Reese was staying with the BBC until 1939, he's basically pushed. Um, was Reese BBC the right thing at the time in the 1920s, possibly because you couldn't have the chaos of that lovely long low hut filled with long low people in Riddle. It needed structure, but possibly too much structure from Reith. Inform, educate, and entertain. Well, to quote the old song, two out of three isn't bad. As the BBC comes through, the problem I see now uh, um, is, as you, the, the BBC failed to move with the times. You know, now the vast majority of our content is streamed. It's online. It's from the air. In fact, I know an awful lot of people of younger generations than me, and even younger generations than my young friend on the right here, who would never watch terrestrial TV. It's just not something they do, they even understand it. They want TV, and I, I did some work with a, a, a TV company in um, America a couple of years ago, the Titanic Channel of all things, and he said each program is eight minutes. That's it. And you may notice that Channel 5 and Channel 4 now, they're documentaries. If you actually time them, two minutes tell you what they're going to tell you, two minutes, then six minutes tell you, two minutes tell you, and then they go to advert break and tell you. So we've now broken down eight minutes, because eight minutes is the tension span of most people under 35 now. So that's where broadcasting has gone. And you can't tell the story because people flip, and people flip between channels. People will move things. The BBC hasn't moved with that. It's local radio station, and we spent a poor being on the at the moment. It's become hugely diversified, but can we, and, you know, at times, I mean, I did three counties radio for a little while. I wasn't convinced there was actually anybody listening. There is, I can tell you, I, I do the Sunday breakfast, six till 10, and six till seven, you, do, you, get, you get no, you get no phone call. You get, you get a, the, the same two or three, you just call in for a chat to the producer. They don't, they don't want to get on air, they just want to speak to someone. And, but in a way, that's sort of, I don't say that's what the BBC is there for, but it, for many people, it's, it's a reliable kind of rock. Um, and I, there are lovely people working there. I think just like the long low part of long low people, it's made up of lots of tea. And you see it in the Second World War when it had to leave London and go like variety, I think went to Bristol and drama, went to uh, Birmingham and it spread out to hide away basically, you know. And you just get these little pockets of, of good teams working together. And when they're allowed to make stuff, I think it's brilliant. The trouble is their hands are kind of hogtied at the minute because lots of management things, budget stuff. When people get to make stuff, I've, I've worked with great teams, and then you just like, oh, and it's not going to get on air because of some ridiculous reason or whatever. So it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to fund, but I just think, um, yeah. It's part, part of me hopes it does continue, but I think we've both convinced it can't continue in this current form. It's become too ponderous, and too, in some ways, incestuous, perhaps, uh, in some ways, uh, perhaps a little bit, what's the phrase, woke as well. I think the thing is, uh, the, the other dilemma I think you have. Is, is the BBC there to have the best people, um, or do you let them go to commercial? And the whole thing publishing pay grades means that suddenly people like Chris Evans, I've worked with a lot, as soon as that was published, he's like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go and earn more at Virgin for a smaller audience, but I don't have to tell people what I earn, and I have a nicer life. You know, John Sobel, Emily Maitlis, they're all going because they don't want that thing of being on that big list. But you could do a BBC that is loud and brash and Bruce Forsyth and strictly lovely glitter ball you've got here and thing. Um, you can do that, or you can let the commercial lot do that and have the BBC do something smaller, quieter, that grows stuff. And it's, you can't be both. I, I, feel, I, like I, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it was a plant. I feel like it was a plant for your answers, but it's fascinating to hear what you Well, look, any more, any more for any more in the house? The BBC initially like funded, it, and Paul touched onto it, well, it was a big problem. The first problem was Marconi, bless them, they owned all the patents. They went, well, we ought to get a bigger share than the other five companies. That was an issue. Um, so the BBC was funded by two mechanisms. Uh, all the companies put money in uh, to form the initial buy shares. And then the idea was everybody had to buy a license fee, 10 shillings for the year, to listen in. Now, some people out there will remember radio license fees. Um, there was a bit of a problem with license fees as much as it was quite tricky to work out whether you actually had one. And Mayor and my lawyers, lovely radio meters, they went, yeah, no. Now they then decided that what they do is they tax commercial radio sets. So the two out there, yeah, about 20% of its cost, and indeed 30% of every valve, because they had to be replaced quite regularly, was then paid back to the BBC. So it was a tax on all the equipment. Of course, 
For less than radio amateurs, they went, yeah, we're just going to buy it from Belgium, or we're going to buy it from America, or we're going to wind our own coils. So, of course, coming back to your question, how you fund the BBC, it always fought. And the BBC grew huge. By 1928, they've got 27 orchestras. Um, thousands of people working there, and that's a massive, massive drain on resources. So, the licence fee was enforced, and it was considered to be bad form if you don't pay it, but that today, you know, we've now got the problem with the TV licence. I think it's, it, am I saying that for the first year, at least, maybe longer, most listeners were listening on sets they'd made, yeah. and, they're, and weren't paying a penny towards the BBC. And one of Eckersley's things, wasn't it, as chief engineer, he'd go on the air still, his one time on the air was him going, listen, you must pay your licences, and he would tour around the country doing a little, saying, we've got a, we've got a van, we'll come and get you. And uh, he's, he's, that was his one thing on air. His other one was, the problem is a lot of the home built equipment there, which is a receiver, but people wanted to hear from a long way away, so they were adding more and more valves. Now what that did was it tended to oscillate, which basically means the receiver became a transmitter. So Peter became, please don't oscillate Eckersley, because uh, it used to howl around. And in fact, sometimes in London when burrows were thinking, all you could hear was all the receivers taking off and transmitting and just screaming away. So in point of fact, that's why the commercial sets came in, because they were much better designed and front ends. But again, the BBC lost money all the way through its first five, six years. And the big companies, British Thomas Houston, Metropolitan Vickers, Marconi's, um, STC, they just poured money in, um, providing all the equipment for free and equipment. But don't forget that Mr. Marconi himself never understood the business model for British broadcasting. This was a man who built an empire on point-to-point -point communications. I'm going to sell you a transmitter and a transmitter and I'm going to send you a message. I'm going to provide the radio operators and all the maintenance and every word you send I get a bit of money for that. He built an empire on that. To the day he died, Marconi, the genius, never understood how I sell you one transmitter that will last for 40 years because we make great transmitters and then millions of people can listen in for free. Where's the business in that? In fact, Marconi, the man, didn't actually appear on British radio until 1925. So he really never, he thought it was a complete waste of wavelength. And sometimes I wonder, when I listen to one or two of the radio stations up there, whether the genius wasn't quite right. But that's, that's a little controversial. Well, to, if I could pre out today a little bit, I, I was working on, on Top Gear a few years ago, and one, it was when they, Clarkson left and Evans and that battle block arrived. And, you know, there's like, do we transform the show? Do we take it on the road? Do we do it live? All those things. And we were told by BBC on High, you have to keep the stick and you have to keep the track at Dunsville Aerodrome because that's how we make our money. American millionaires come over and pay a million quid down the lap of the track at the stick. So he stays, the track stays. Because things like that, it's like BBC Studios and all that sort of stuff, they're branching out and going, the licensing's not enough. How do we monetize you know, Doctor Who and David Attenborough and all those sorts of things? Um, that's sort of driving it as well. Um, because they're fighting against not just commercial nowadays, but um, podcasts and, um, and to tie in with a plug as well. I've, I've run a part of this project is I've run a podcast called the British Broadcasting Century. If you're a podcast listener, do find us. You'll find Tim on there lots, uh, telling the story in a very granular way. Um, but the details on the, on the, on the, uh, the programmes you've got here. Um, plus the book I'm writing about all this that's not out yet, but by Christmas called Auntie and Uncles, would be a novel of this. Tim, though, has lots of other books out there as well, so as you go. Yeah, what we do is, as you've all sat very patiently listening to us waffle on, um, thank you so much for coming on this on this difficult day as well. Um, thank you so much for supporting Northern House and the, uh, the Chapel Trust that looks after this amazing building. Um, 245 years, there have been so many different events in here, and this has just been one more. I think it's been successful. What I'd like to do is, first thing is, as you leave, if you'd like to buy one of Paul's most excellent books, one of my very erudite books, so we're saying, we're pleased to sign them. We always Personal inscriptions, love and kisses, we always have Paris as one of my favourite, and that's just Paul. Um, but before we do that, before we head out, um, please have a very safe journey home. Uh, and as a very last thing, please put your hands together one more time for the start of the show tonight.
long, you can just chat over it, you can go to the, but a little bit of Eckersley doing what Eckersley did, uh, the opera, all that stuff. But feel free, go as you wish, chat away, have a glance of things out there. Thank you. Cheers. Hello, DQ, I'm Harry Hello, DQ, this is Two Emma Talk, Ripple Testing. This is Two Emma Talk, Ripple Testing. Hello, DQ, hello. Hello, Ash, hello, Ash. Ash, hello. Uh, the signal's okay. No, they're not. Wave your hand if it's all okay. No wave. No wave at all. Kurt. Kurt, he's never right in there. Kurt! No, not. Sorry, sorry, well, sorry, DQ, you down the Hello, DQ, hello, DQ. This is Two Emma Talk, Ripple Testing. This is Two Emma Talk, Ripple Testing. Tonight, we have a most marvelous thing that's going to happen. We are going to receive Rose, that famous Italian tenor, that famous Italian tenor, what's his name? Veridico is going to sing non tutto perone fantissimo, which being translated means, uh, it's very difficult. This year I played this sad way of the head to die. To a small group of nine year olds, and they were laughing out loud. Now we're going to receive it. Maybe it's that mysterious. There may be some, there may be some jamming. There may be some oxidation. Woo! But hang on, thank you. And the original hut, the original piano still exists in Chapter Square. This year I took back, he reckons his two granddaughters for the first time in 100 years. They banged the piano and they sang that opera. And I had a small tear in my eye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming.